I know what you're thinking. Seriously? That is a big claim in the title. But bear with us, this might not be your usual Global Cycling Network video. But through this sport, we often get to meet different, really talented people, some of whom are at the forefront of their fields. One such person is Professor Inigo San Milan. Regular viewers will know him as the coach of the world's best male rider, Tade Pogaccio, but he's also involved in cancer research as well. We'll let him explain why elite cyclists are guiding his research, but we think it is fascinating and exciting. So we've left the interview long. As always, if you enjoy this type of content, let us know, give it a big thumbs up. Professor Inigo Samuelan, thank you so much for joining us on GCM once again. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Sam. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be here again. Cool. Well, so I know you as the head of performance at one of the most prestigious cycling teams, most successful cycling teams on the planet. But could you also explain how you're involved in medical research as well? So, yeah, when I went to the U.S. Uh, uh, from here, from the Basque Country, almost 16 years ago, I, I, I started to work at School of Medicine and the, as well as in the University Hospital. And that's where I was exposed to uh, many different diseases. And um, I was very curious and I really wanted to see, uh, uh, learn more, right? So um, one of the things that I started to see is that we are a, a, a medical research institution, right? So there's a lot of medical research. And uh, more and more people are, because also the technologies are improving and the interests therefore, are moving into what happens at the cellular level and at the metabolic level. And, and this, is, this is what I've been doing or I have been doing for many years with athletes. And it, it was always in the back of my mind to try to someday to, to, to bring some of these concepts to, uh, to, to other diseases. Because I always say we cannot understand imperfection and we don't know perfection in the first place. And working with these athletes, uh, is they're, they're, that's perfection. They are the, uh, the best machines uh, on the planet and therefore can, can hold some keys or some, or some insights into uh, what happens at the metabolic level or dysregulations uh, dysregul that happens at the cellular level in different diseases. So that's why I kind of got exposed and at the same time people are getting into this space also. So that's, that's, that's been quite a journey. Yeah, because it, it seems like, to my mind anyway, which is to say, you know, very much a layman's perspective, that it's quite a novel area for research. My sort of um, perception of where cancer research is, is, it's all about genetics and things like that. But this is where you're, what you're looking at is different now, right? Could you explain a bit about it? Yeah, so it's, everything starts just 100 years ago this year. Uh, was a Nobel Prize uh, Otto Warburg from Germany uh, discovered the transformation of a normal cell into a cancer cell. So uh, uh, what Otto Warburg discovered is that uh, cancer cells are characterized by utilizing a lot of glucose and producing a lot of lactate. Okay. And uh, uh, therefore, he, uh, he already pointed or posited that uh, cancer could be a metabolic disease. But uh, I'm talking about 1923, where uh, the uh, DNA hasn't been, hadn't been discovered yet. So, um, um, but he didn't have the technology that we have nowadays, but he kept pushing and pushing for that idea. Uh, until DNA uh, came along in 1953, uh, discovered by Watson and Crick, and uh, the whole field completely changed, right? And everything was about genetics, right? And uh, uh, everything that Warburg tried to explain, it was completely buried and forgotten until, until recently. Um, and, and, and in part was uh, because <clears throat> the, the fight against cancer through genetics hasn't worked as, as it was promised back in the days. Remember that we were told like, yeah, we, we're gonna turn off a gene and we're gonna cure cancer. That has never happened. Um, and also uh, even Watson, who's still alive, uh, has been promoting the idea that uh, uh, targeting uh, genes uh, to cure cancer has been, quote, uh, remarkably unhelpful and that uh, there are new pathways that need to be explored. And, and one of them is the Warburg effect. Uh, discovered by Otto Warburg, so we had to, in a way, travel back to the future, right, uh, to the days of Otto Warburg, and, uh, and, and that's metabolism, right? But the problem is, like, uh, uh, as, as Watson said in, in one interview, that uh, there's, nobody any, there's nobody in the field because everybody focused on genetics and uh, biochemistry or metabolism at the cellular level disappeared. So many generations of cancer researchers and oncologists they have never received information 
right, uh, about, uh, uh, or education about metabolism, right? So, so that w one night I, I, I was hearing about the war, war effect uh, uh, because all this started to bring back the war effect and, and from having absolutely no citations in the uh, scientific literature uh, until the turn of the century, little by little there were more, but it's been in the last 10 years that it has increased about 3,000%. Wow. Right, uh, to extend and almost now every single cancer research paper, either in the abstract or in the introduction, already talks about the war effect. So one night, about uh, seven years ago, I was studying like what were effect. I, I don't know much about genetics, and I don't you know. So I started to read. Okay, finally, I need to know what it is, you know, because a lot of people talk about it, and I and I, I was fascinated because uh, it's it's uh, metabolism, right? And, uh, and 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 furthermore, that was the subject of my doctorate thesis. Uh, we call it uh, in in muscle physiology. We call it um, um, aerobic glycolysis or cytosolic glycolysis. Uh, in cancer, it's called the Warburg effect. But the players are identical; they're the same. And therefore, I said, "Wow! If if I did my doctorate thesis in this field, and I see that in in, in cancer, uh, and uh, the people are trying to figure out, I think I can try to really uh, uh, cross to the other side. And, and and with the knowledge that we have learned, working with some of the best machines in the world, and understanding very very well all these glycolytic pathways and the lactate pathway." Uh, which is perfectly regulated, we can maybe try to understand what happens at, in cancer at the cellular level. So that's how things started. Okay, and so yeah. when you talk about the players being the same, could you sort of explain mm -hmm. metabolism in the context that you're meaning? Yeah, so obviously cancer is, is uh, the, the, the main hallmark of cancer is an aberrant growth, right, of cells. Uh, they're not efficient metabolically speaking, and they keep growing and growing and growing, and they're very inefficient. And eventually, they, uh, the, the whole organ uh, becomes cancerous and, and, and fails, right? And, and then there's metastasis to all the organs, and the same thing happens, right? Uh, but what I mean, the players are like the same systems. They control normal growth in humans and normal uh, mitochondrial function, normal gly gly glycolysis, or normal bioenergetics. Um, um, in cancer, are completely dysregulated. So <clears throat> for us working in metabolism, we know very well those pathways. So when we start looking under the microscope or looking, we, we do some tracers or we do different experiments with genetic engineering, you know, we, where we change and look at pathways to understand, we, we, we really see that many of these pathways are all over the map. And uh, the question is that, can we modify those pathways? Can we target those pathways as opposed to target the genes that hasn't worked? Can we have a different angle and try to target the um, metabolic pathways or the, the cancer cell metabolism and this is this is what we're trying to do not just our group but other groups around the world and this is what it's called now there's like a, a renaissance in cancer metabolism because more people around the world are, are, are entering through that door so it's fascinating to think that elite athletes might have helped to unlock this understanding but purely because they are as you say perfect specimens if mm -hmm. you like and you can just contrast with what you see in a cancerous cell. Yeah, so absolutely, it's been, it's been great to see this. And, 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 and if it wasn't for, for the lessons learned from elite athletes, at least for me, it, would not, it wouldn't have been possible to understand that this regulation is happening in cancer. Um, and, 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 and now this is, this is what we're doing research in trying to explain what's, what's going on in cancer and try to uh, first explain it and demonstrate that there are new pathways that can be targeted, and, and second, to start targeting those pathways, that hopefully someday, soon, uh, there are novel therapies that can be targeting these pathways, and we can finally corner cancer, because it's gonna be a big avenue. Uh, I mean, anybody working in cancer metabolism can tell you that this is, uh, some people may say this, this is the end of, 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 uh, of the road to fight cancer, uh, or corner it, um, or others c can tell you that we're very close to. Uh, but this is going to be definitely a step up uh, for anything that we have seen so far. Um, so this is a very exciting field. And, and again, at least in, my, in my, my case, it's been very helpful to work with elite athletes to get there. Yeah, because <laughs> if the research is leading you towards targeting <laughs> pathways, what do you mean by a metabolic pathway and, and how might you 
intervene medically? Yeah, so for example, one thing that we know, and, and this is what struck Warburg a hundred years ago, it was like the exacerbated production of lactate. So he saw that the cancer cells, they use a lot of glucose, but they produce a lot of lactate. This is now, by the way, why a lot of people are talking about sugar and cancer, the connection, right? Because finally Warburg effect came back and now it's mainstream. People might not know what the Warburg effect is, but they talk about sugar and cancer which there are a lot of misconceptions. That doesn't mean that sugar is going to cause cancer necessarily, right? But the whole thing is like, yeah, glucose utilizes a lot of glucose. I mean, cancer cells are a lot of glucose uh, or sugars to produce lactate. But what really struck world was lactate, right? So we know from, from athletes uh, that lactate, uh, it's a key signaling pathway. And my, uh, my great dear colleague and, and mentor, uh, George Brooks, from the University of California, Berkeley, he, know, he has been 50 years dedicated to understanding lactate and everything that we know about lactate <clears throat> in sports uh, it comes from his work of 50 years. So now uh, he's also my partner in crime in this, in this, in this field. So we're entering in, in, in what happens also with lactate in, in cancer. So we know that lactate, it's a key signaling molecule for cellular health and homeostasis and uh, also for improving uh, functions at the cellular level and, and even mitochondrial function as well. And, and this, is, this is the great thing of exercise, right, uh, to produce lactate. Uh, it's, it's a very important also for the brain. It's a great fuel for the body. It's the best fuel probably for the body. And when we exercise, we produce lactate, but when we stop exercising, that lactate is cleared, right? In the case of cancer, that lactate it never, it's never cleared. It keeps building up and it's always building up and building up. And what we know and we have discovered and we have proven is that, uh, and we have a, a series of uh, papers now that, that we're going to be publishing in, in the next months or, or year, that that, excesses, that that excessive lactate that is not clear in cancer, which is a characteristic, uh, is uh, deleterious uh, and detrimental for the cell. And it's, uh, it's a key player in, in, in cancer um, uh, process, in what's called carcinogenesis. So by knowing that, we, we try to target lactate. So we've been spending a lot of time all these years trying to figure out why lactate was so central, had a, such a central role in, in, in carcinogenesis. Now we're starting to really uh, intervene, so, uh, and, and others as well, not only us. But uh, so an important thing is like, we can, for example, block one enzyme that produces lactate in the body, specifically in, la in cancer cells. And when we block it, there's no lactate production in these cancer cells. So those cancer cells, they don't express uh, their genes and their proteins, and those cells eventually die. They don't grow and they die. Uh, and also there are other pathways that indirectly produce lactate. That by blocking those pathways, we can block lactate production and achieve the same effect. We can even see uh, a typical thing in cancer is what's called metabolic reprogramming, where normal, normally a cancer cell uses glucose, enters the mitochondria into the Krebs cycle, produces energy, and uh, end of the story, right? Cancer cells, they, they move away from that, and they use a lot of glucose and produce lactate instead of burning the glucose, right? And that's a metabolic reprogramming, uh, typical of cancer. So what we can do with this pathways by targeting is, is to reverse that metabolic reprogramming back to a normal reprogramming. The problem is like those cells are mutated in those cancer cells and uh, they don't like that. So eventually the, the, ca the cancer doesn't know what to do and eventually cannot thrive and die. So this is where we're trying to target different pathways to block lactate production in cancer cells. Okay, and, and at what stage, because you said you can, you've seen that blocking those pathways results mm -hmm. in the cancer cells die is that it, uh, like you know under a microscope or is that in you yeah. know, living organisms yeah. yeah so at this point we're in, in it's what we call basic research which is where ideas start and then you start proving concept or coming with hypotheses that eventually become true or not true excuse me and then this is what uh in this stage we are uh, we have uh, now, for example, even um, have a first prototype. Now we have to take it to mice models, which are preclinical studies, right? And from there, we, we take it to, to humans, right? But obviously, the, the, the upper and the latter you get, the more money you need. And this is, this is what we're all, always 
uh, fighting for funds, you know, and uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's very difficult to continue, right? But, uh, but the things like, yeah, we even have a prototype of a nanoparticle uh, which can detect cancer, uh, and it needs some fine um, uh, tuning, but um, uh, it can be, uh, it's, it's, the nanoparticles are about the size of a virus, very extremely small, about a 1,000 times smaller than the diameter of a hair, right? And uh, you can, you can, you can uh, inject thousands into the body and, and, uh, and then you can uh, <laughs> load them with medications. So, but the thing is that like, they need to recognize the cancer cell, right? Because otherwise they can kill all the cells in the body, right? So we have a first prototype uh, which ca which ca of a nanoparticle which can recognize a cancer cell. And then uh, the next level is to uh, fine tune that nanoparticle and then load it with medication that once it penetrates the cancer cell, because it penetrates, it's, it's, it releases um, the, the different drugs and it, it kills the cancer cell by blocking these pathways that I was mentioning. So, um, yeah, that's the phase that we hopefully to get some of the funds to take it to, to uh, like uh, animal models, in this case, are either um, uh, uh, rats or mice, uh, which is, you know, that some people work, you know, with animals, they it might seem sensible, but they've been saving human race, you know, um, uh, these animals. Um, so yeah, to take it to these animals, try and do that with them, and if it works, that's when you go to the real clinical trials with humans. So this is in this stage we are still very infant, yeah. if you will. But nevertheless, that technology is, is mind-blowing, mm -hmm. really. Absolutely incredible. Um, <laughs> lastly then, are you, are you relatively optimistic about where the research is leading you at the minute? I'm very optimistic, and I am optimistic that, uh, yeah, because we, we're, I mean, all there, this is growing and growing, right? And, and I know I'm not going to cure cancer, of course, but at least we open new doors, right? And that's the whole goal of, of all of us um, uh, contributing, right? So once you open the door or others open the door, you keep entering and you keep opening doors and doors and doors. And, and we're very optimistic that this, as I mentioned earlier, uh, could be maybe the last step to finally conquer cancer. Uh, still we're in the infancy, but uh, it's, it's quite promising. And, and then combined with other approaches like immunotherapy, for example, which by the way, the immunotherapy was discovered about 23 years ago. And uh, um, um, Jim Allison received Nobel Prize for that. And when, when, when he was presented it in, in, in conferences, he was almost being thrown tomatoes at, you know, because it was a crazy idea that the immune system could kill cancer. Uh, and and uh, but because he was completely foreign to cancer, and he was like a an invader, an intruder, right? Uh, but yeah, you know, 20 years later, yeah, immunotherapy cures completely about 10-15% uh, uh, of of patients who receive it. Um, it mainly is uh, leukemias and melanomas, uh, but it doesn't work in other cancers. But for those who work, it's incredible uh, advancement, right? So. That's why, like, uh, it was just 23 years ago, and I think in 20 years or less, hopefully, we will be in a whole uh, better situation combining novel therapeutics, especially through cancer metabolism. Great stuff. Well, I mean, like I say, my mind is blown. I wish you all the best with Thank the you continued very much. research. It sounds absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed this incredible insight. Something a little bit different for GCN, but, uh, but give it a big thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And uh, Inigo, thank you once again for your time. Thank you very much, pleasure. Simon. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it.